Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our AC Forum webinar is a policy prescription for reducing health disparities, uh, achieving pharmacoequity. I am honored and pleased to introduce our presenters, uh, Dr. Utibe Essien. He is an assistant professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine, the University of California, Los Angeles. Also, Dr. Arthur Allen, he's a PharmD and the Anticoagulation Program Manager at the VA Salt Lake City Healthcare System. And Dr. Naomi Yates, also PharmD, the manager at, um, in the Clinical Pharmacy Services, Outpatient Pharmacy Anticoagulation Service at Kaiser Permanente. And I am Noel Ryan. I am the manager for the Henry Ford Medical Group Ambulatory Anticoagulation Services for Henry Ford Health in Detroit. So we're pleased to announce that the, there is CE for this. There's one hour of ethics CE available. And uh, Amanda will be putting the link to this in the chat. And so I will go ahead and let uh, Dr. Utibe Essien begin. All right, well, thank you so much for um, the invitation to share with you all today. Um, really excited for our discussion, uh, kind of an abbreviated uh, title in our talk here um, called Reducing Health Disparities. Uh, and achieving pharmacoequity. And um, I'll spend about 25, 30 minutes in kind of formal uh, remarks and we're really, really looking forward to our discussion, um, both of a clinical case as well as any questions that might come up from um, our conversation today, um, where we'll um, hopefully be able to share on these following objectives, um, explaining a little bit about why health equity matters. I think we've all kind of talked about this phrase over the last several years. Um, so really putting it into the context of um, the global pandemic that we're working our way to the other side of. Um, the second objective will be really describing this condition that we're all thinking about um, fairly regularly, um, especially in this group uh, around atrial fibrillation and how it really is a model disease for examining um, health equity more broadly and specifically pharmacal equity when it comes to anticoagulation. Um, and lastly, providing a framework for how we achieve this goal of pharmacal equity. And before getting into that framework, we'll of course hopefully be able to share what that phrase really means and where its, uh, its origin was, um, which as I mentioned, really starts with this broader health equity conversation because we know that over the last several years, as I've mentioned, we've been in the midst of this really unprecedented moment in our um, in our society, uh, where we've seen really de uh, excuse me death um, and destruction, sadly, and uh, really loss like it's never been seen um, for a generation. And many of us who've been working professionally and um, sadly, in some cases, personally, have really experienced the. Um, loss at the hand of the uh, coronavirus. But we also know that that experience really did not uh, affect our society equitably, that individuals in particular from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups across the country really had disproportionately uh, experienced the pandemic. And my colleagues and I, and perhaps many of you all have written about or talked about these inequities from the earliest days of COVID up until now, um, around rates in differential rates of infection, hospitalization, and death um, from the pandemic amongst racial and ethnic minority groups. And despite though, um, that confluence of a global pandemic and rampant health disparities, we also really were exposed to incredible innovation over the last several years to treat COVID. And we saw antiretrovirals and monoclonal antibodies and the really effective COVID vaccines um, that have made it possible for us to be able to quote unquote get back to our regular lives. Um, and so we have to actually take a step back and realize that this was pretty incredible to see how much discovery took place over these two years or these three years now. Um, 
But sadly, when we had a chance to kind of look under the hood, so to speak, at who was getting access to that novel treatment, this will be my last COVID slide before getting into the, what we really care about. Um, but when we looked under that hood, we did see really significant differences between in monoclonal antibody use amongst racial and ethnic groups. And you can see the lines start to diverge over those early uh, months of the pandemic with individuals who are white receiving these newer monoclonal antibodies to treat COVID compared to those who were non-white. And it really was that story that we saw amongst the COVID-19 treatment um, that brought to bear this idea of pharmaco equity. Because just as racial and ethnic minorities were being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, we saw them also have disproportionately poor access to treatments. And sadly, that's a story that has existed across decades in our healthcare system here. Uh, and it's how we kind of came across this term pharmaco equity to try and explain that phenomenon and hopefully try and identify some ways to address it. And so we defined pharmaco equity as the goal of ensuring that individuals, regardless of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, have affordable access to the highest quality of medications required to manage their health needs. I think there are really some key words in that definition that um, will play a role throughout our talk today, including the affordability, the highest quality of medications. And I think throughout this talk, we'll also describe that the entire therapeutic continuum must be addressed if we really want to achieve this goal of pharmacoequity, from the development of novel treatments to the testing of these drugs in clinical trials, the prescribing of drugs by clinicians, where patients actually obtain their medications, including at the pharmacy, and finally, how patients can safely and effectively use their medication. So across this continuum is something that we'll be talking about today. And I'm also going to argue that this goal of pharmacal equity sadly has been one that has eluded us for decades, as I mentioned, in particular in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular diseases, which even throughout the pandemic remain the number one cause of death. Um, and which of course we know atrial fibrillation falls within that scope. And so that brings us into our second objective, thinking about atrial fibrillation as a model disease for examining health equity. Um, again, this group knows this all too for, uh, well, that atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm disorder worldwide, impacting up to 60 million individuals um, worldwide, about the ranges from 3 million to 6 million, to as high as 7 million here in the US um, as well. So incredibly, uh, incredibly common condition, we open any other um, scientific journal over um, the, the weeks, you can see that this um, condition has been being described uh, in the scientific literature, whether it's related to how and whether we should be screening for AFib or we should be ge um, genetically testing for individuals who are at higher risk for AFib. So we really see it everywhere. Um, and I think the aging of our population along with an increase in many of the risk factors that can contribute to atrial fibrillation, such as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, um, are really why we're seeing a rising discussion around atrial fibrillation. And those risk factors that I refer to are also one of are also closely linked to um, the number one cause of death and disability in patients with AFib, which we know is ischemic stroke, the risk of which is about five times higher in patients who hold a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And so how do we prevent strokes from happening in this population? It's a big reason why I, as a general internist, um, I'm really passionate about atrial fibrillation because we have treatments, we have drugs that can actually reduce that risk of stroke by up to 70%. Um, and those medications refer to as anticoagulation or blood thinners. Um, its origin is, is highlighted in this headline. Um, way back in the day from rat poison with the first, very first class of these blood thinners called warfarin. Um, and this was back when I was a medical student that this was really the only medication available to help prevent strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation was warfarin, founded back in the 1950s. Um, but when we fast forward to my second year of medical school uh, in 2010, the FDA first approved this um, newer class of blood thinner medications called direct oral anticoagulants or DOACs. Some people call them novel oral anticoagulants or NOACs. Um, but these medications have really changed the game in treating patients for, uh, for stroke prevention. 
in atrial fibrillation. And so not only are these medications easier to use, they have fewer side effects, you're not having to show up to your doctor's office or pharmacy to um, get a blood drawn every four to six weeks to check your levels. But these medications, these DOAC medications, have also had improved outcomes in nearly all patients with atrial fibrillation. So better at preventing strokes and also supporting uh, preventing other adverse cardiac events in patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, and this includes cardiac events such as strokes, such as heart failure, such as coronary heart disease, uh, as well as death. And it's really interesting that as we think about who is more likely to get these adverse effects when they have atrial fibrillation, uh, that a colleague about almost um, seven years ago now or so published a study that demonstrated that actually it was the Black patients with atrial fibrillation who have a double the risk of, nearly double the risk of stroke, higher risk of heart failure and coronary heart disease, and about a twofold higher risk of death when they have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation compared to their white counterparts. So this is a really notable finding published in a high impact journal. Um, but as I met with my colleague back then at one of the cardiology conferences, he highlighted that one of the gaps in their study was that they didn't actually have information on how these patients were treated for their atrial fibrillation. So there's no medication information in this study. And that really became the thing that I uh, became passionate about, trying to understand whether the difference in treating patients with atrial fibrillation with these stroke um, preventing therapies or blood thinners can actually help reduce the risk of stroke disparities, as well as reduce the risk of mortality disparities, disparities between black and white patients with atrial fibrillation. And you can see some of the studies that my colleagues and I have published over the last several years that have tried to answer that question. I'm gonna dive into a few of those in our time together. Hopefully um, you bear with me as a, a nerdy researcher and in getting into some of the weeds of our science. Um, but it's been really exciting to kind of take this journey over the last several years and a journey that I'm hoping uh, as we have some time for Q&A later, we can learn a little bit more about how you all are thinking about these questions in your daily practice. And so there are a few studies that I mentioned, um, as I showed in that last slide that we've looked at over the years. We'll just focus on three of them in our talk today. Um, and I'll share a little bit about the transition as we went through these three studies and why I chose um, these three in particular. Um, but before diving into those studies, I'd, I'd like to share this slide to really um, uh, demonstrate how we've been thinking about this problem of atrial fibrillation treatment equity over um, the last seven years or so now. And this has been our conceptual model to try and think about uh, adapted a health disparities research approach to thinking about the patient factors, the provider factors, as well as the system level factors that all come together to influence whether a patient receives appropriate therapy and whether that therapy is provided in an equitable way. And some of these factors listed on your screen, we've been able to actually tease out in the registries or the insurance claims databases or the electronic health record data that we've used. But there are many others that are far more difficult to obtain. And I'm hoping that perhaps as we go, as I go through my slides here, that there are some factors that you're wondering, well, how come you guys didn't think about this? Or did you have a chance to look at that? Um, and those are some of the questions and conversations that I'm hoping to have on the other side. Uh, of the formal remarks. But again, thinking about as we go through these slides about this framework um, and whether or not there are other factors that you are looking at in your research or in your practice, um, would love to dive into that as well. And so speaking of diving, let's get into the first study um, we'll talk about, which was a study published back in 2018 um, using the uh, Orbit AF2 registry. And so what is that registry? Cardiologists love a good acronym, and this is one of them. Um, it's the Outcomes Registry for Better Informed Treatment of Atrial Fibrillation. So a pretty, pretty good one. Um, and this was a prospective registry of patients on the outpatient side um, with a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Recruited from across the country, about 240 sites um, from 2013 to 2016. And the main outcome of interest in our study, which you'll see is pretty common interest or outcome of interest across the three studies we'll look at today, was the rate of warfarin and DOAC use by race and ethnicity. So that was our study and uh, outcome. And this was our study cohort, um, where after eligibility criteria were included, we examined about 11,000 white patients, 
647 Black and 671 Hispanic individuals. And I, I like showing this slide here. It's the only time I'll show the study population slide in particular, because as we were first presenting these um, data, one of the questions that came up was, well, what's going on with the racial representation of your cohort? It seems a little different from the national population, which is about 12% Black right now uh, and about 18% Hispanic. So why are the numbers so different in this cohort? Um, and that's something we've been thinking about over the last several years as well. And noting that um, we published a, a paper in 2021 that found that that representation by race was not unique to our study. That actually is something that's been going on in atrial fibrillation studies across the last decade. So if you kind of go clockwise from um, the one o'clock hour there, so to speak, in 2009, all the way to the 12 o'clock hour in 2019, and look at several of the atri key atrial fibrillation studies, including the um, key anticoagulant studies that actually put these DOAC medications on uh, in clinical guidelines, there's really been significant underrepresentation by race of non-white individuals represented in the orange bars in each study, including as few as in the last study in 2019, 2% um, of individuals in that Cabana trial were identified as black individuals. And so I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, that the pharmacal equity um, goal really has to address the continuum of care uh, across um, the therapeutic continuum. And this includes in who actually gets enrolled into our clinical trial. So I did want to take that moment to pause on that and reflect on um, those findings as we think about how we address pharmacal equity in the future. And so using some uh, multivariable um, logistic regression models, including adjusting for some of the factors that I showed in our conceptual framework, like demographics, socioeconomic status, and even the type of provider that a patient saw, um, we started to dive into some of our findings. And the first key finding here um, is that patients who were Black with atrial fibrillation were really different from patients in the other groups. And so if we focus on um, that group of patients in particular, you see that they were overall younger, that they had high, higher rates of chronic conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and heart failure. Um, and they were actually also enrolled differently um, in the study. So Black patients and Hispanic patients were more likely to be enrolled in this study by a primary care doctor um, compared to their white counterparts. And you can imagine that that may influence the way they receive treatment. Um, next, further down table one, we see that there are also differences in socioeconomic status. Perhaps you've seen this in some of the studies that you have led where um, there have been lower access to income, um, differential insurance status, so much higher rates of Medicaid enrollment uh, in individuals who are Black and Hispanic. Um, and less likely to graduate with a college or postgraduate degree if you're Black or Hispanic. And so really different um, uh, socioeconomic markers as well as clinical markers in this group. And what did we find when we actually looked at anticoagulation prescribing, the meat of this study? Um, I'll orient you all a little bit to this slide. So the left column shows our racial and ethnic groups, white, Black, and Hispanic. The middle column shows where we further where we adjusted for our clinical and demographic markers, um, some of which you can see in the asterisks there. Uh, and the left right two columns show when we further adjusted for socioeconomic markers, including income, insurance, and education level. And the key finding here, and here's where we're looking at, where do you receive any anticoagulation? So did you walk out of your clinic visit with a prescription for warfarin or a prescription for DOAC therapy? And again, the key finding we see here is that Black individuals had about a 25% lower odds, lower chance of getting out of the office with a prescription for any blood thinner it, when we adjusted for clinical and demographic markers. And that um, finding was no longer statistically significant when we included our socioeconomic markers. So key finding there, as well as that there is no differences between white and Hispanic patients. So what happens when we looked at DOAC prescribing? Well, again, orienting you all, we see the racial and ethnic groups, adjusting for clinical and demographic markers in the middle two columns, socioeconomic markers in the further right columns. And we see that there's even more notable difference. It's nearly 40% lower odds of a black patient receiving a DOAC. So this is, did you walk out of the visit with a DOAC with a newer prescription? Um, about 37% lower chance of that happening. 
And when we further adjusted for our socioeconomic markers, that finding remains statistically significant, about a 28% lower odds of walking out of the office with a DOAC prescription if you're a Black patient compared to if you're a white patient. Um, again, no difference found but when we looked at white versus Hispanic patients. And so this was a pretty new finding. It had not previously been truly reported showing these racial differences in DOAC use in particular in the DOAC era um, for atrial fibrillation treatment. The New York Times um, picked up our findings, which is really awesome. As a New Yorker, my parents were super proud. Um, and it was cool to start to kind of talk a little bit about these early um, conversations around pharmaco equity. And I note, mentioned to the, um, to the journalist that questions of adherence and expense may enter a provider's mind in choosing a medicine, but unconscious bias is also an issue and that we may have certain assumptions about patients that are irrelevant to healthcare and fail to offer them the full breadth of medical treatment. I imagine that some of you all who have been in practice have felt that um, feeling um, of the inability to really be able to fully offer our patients the best treatment for themselves. And I think that comes into play as we think about what it actually costs to keep our patients on these treatments, on these newer DOAC therapies, for example, which can range anywhere in the 500s of dollars. Um, if you're not having insurance and you're trying to get a prescription for a Pixaban, the Bigatran or Rivaroxaban, which are the three most commonly used um, DOAC treatments right now. And so you can imagine sitting in clinic, your um, patient with a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, they have a stroke risk that warrants um, treatment with one of these blood thinner th um, treatments, you turn your computer over to them so they can see what their monthly cost is going to be, how challenging that conversation would be when you're suggesting, you know, hey, these three medications on the top have really been shown to be more effective, to be easier to use than the one on the bottom there. Um, but that price point is really going to be challenging. And that's something that we deal with every day in our clinical practice. It's a reason why for example, the, um, the U.S. announced that they're going to actually start with Medicare, at least, to negotiate prices for um, these medications. And wouldn't you know that it's number one and number three on their list of top 10 drugs that they're going to negotiate prices for are um, Eliquis or Pixaban and Xarelto or Rivaroxaban. So this is really a key topic, a timely topic, something really important to our patients and our communities. Um, and it's something that I mentioned, it really impacts populations differently, especially when we see that there are different rates of actual developing a stroke, actually dying from atrial fibrillation, depending on your race. Um, and we're now showing that there are differential rates of receiving treatment. It's something that we have to address in real, real urgency. Um, and, and speaking of urgency, I have about five, seven more minutes or so before we wanted to get to the second part of um, our discussion today. So. I'm going to skip over one of the studies that I wanted to talk to you about, um, where we examined this question in a Medicare database. Um, and I'll, I can share a little bit about that if we have time in the Q&A. Uh, but spoiler alert is we did find similar disparities in Medicare uh, enrollees as well. Um, and we really want to jump into our study that was published two years ago in the Veterans Health Administration, because I think the VA is such a unique health environment. It's one that I've been in over the last five years. It's where my um, career development award is from, um, where I'm really studying how we improve equitable access to patients in the VA with atrial fibrillation. Um, and one of the reasons why the VA is such a phenomenal um, uh, environment to study health equity is that medications in the VA are so much more affordable than that slide from a couple of slides ago where I showed you um, for the out-of-pocket costs of some of these medications. So any veteran um, who comes in, uh, who has a um, experience having served in the military pays anywhere from five to $11 a month for their for a 30 day supply of prescriptions. And the $11 are the tier three medications, including the ones that we're talking about today. The $5 are more to tier one medications such as warfarin, uh, more generic therapies. And so you can imagine your patient who comes in with a diagnosis of diabetes and hypertension, and atrial fibrillation, they're on five to six medications. Um, they cross the street to our local university hospital and they're paying upwards of seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a month for their prescriptions. Um, they come to the VA and they're paying anywhere from 50 to $60 for their prescriptions. So it's really incredible to see that difference um, in, in cost of care. 
Uh, and our question really was, does that difference still potentially influence the racial disparities that we saw outside of the VA? And so we similarly um, created a fun acronym and with our study uh, in the VA, the Race, Ethnicity, and Anticoagulant Choice in Atrial Fibrillation or the REACH AF study. Um, it's been an, it's a nationwide study of about a thousand, over a thousand clinics nationally in the VA. Um, and this study that we published two years ago used the time frame from 2014 to 2018 um, to examine racial disparities in treatment of veterans with atrial fibrillation. And lo and behold, we found really similar findings to what we found outside of the VA. And so, again, I like to orient you all to, to my slides here. The racial and ethnic groups are in the left column there. Um, unlike in our first study, where we're really only able to look at white, black, and Hispanic patients in the VA, when you have over 110,000 uh, veterans that we're able to examine, we're actually able to include some of the really underrepresented groups, such as Asian Americans and American Indian Alaskan Native individuals, um, and start to look at and examine some of the disparities of those groups as well. Uh, in the middle column, we're showing um, access to any anticoagulation, and we showed that Black individuals had about a 10% lower chance of leaving that visit with any blood thinner, warfarin, or a DOAC. And we also saw differences among Asian individuals. Um, when we look at DOAC prescribing, again, really, really similar differences to what we saw outside the VA, about a 26% lower odds of Black patients getting a DOAC. Um, and you see differences in Hispanic and American Indian Alaskan Native individuals as well. And so I think it was really critical for us to do this study in the VA to show that the issues around equity, equitable access to care and atrial fibrillation is not just about cost, that there are some impacts around racial difference that really are playing a role and that we really need to further tease out. Um, and I think this framework for achieving pharmacal equity starts to help us tease some of that out a little bit. And so um, again, with a few minutes left, I'll share a little bit about how I'm thinking about this framework. Uh, and hopefully when we have um, some time in this Q&A, we can talk a little bit more about um, some of the nuance ar around these, um, these ABCs, as I call them, of access, bias, and cost. Um, and the quality there is kind of the overarching theme that I think really um, brings together each of these three pieces. So what do we do about access? I think many pharmacists on the call, uh, and so you can appreciate that access is not just about having an insurance card or having a copay card, that access is so much deeper than that. And um, that access has to do with where patients are literally geographically able to obtain their medications. What does it mean for a patient to have to take multiple subways if you live in a great city like New York um, or drive two and a half hours to their nearest pharmacy um, just because they have an EHR, just because they have that prescription in hand or through their um, through to their pharmacy, it's still so challenging for them to obtain their medications. And so I think our goal in uh, achieving pharmacal equity needs to be to really reimagine what access means and know that it has to be, um, look way beyond just having uh, health insurance, which we know is still a huge problem here in our country as well. Um, Bias in care, bias in prescribing. You know, I mentioned that cost of care cannot be the real reason why there are racial inequities um, that we see in um, atrial fibrillation treatment, because even when cost is low, we still see racial differences. And so how do we tease, how do we examine, how do we look into bias in care? Um, there's a really neat study published now seven years ago um, that actually asked medical students and uh, residents around some of their falsely held beliefs about individuals. And, and not only did they hold these false beliefs, including some of the statements listed on your screen here, but individuals who held these and endorsed these beliefs were actually less likely to prescribe pain medications to their black patients when they received the vignette case um, with either a white patient or a black patient. And so this was a really, again, phenomenal way to start to tease out how on, on biases, unconscious or otherwise, might actually influence the way 
that we treat our patients. And these biases look beyond race. They're thinking about social class. We had a study that um, looked at homeless veterans to see how we may or may not treat them differently with atrial fibrillation and found really similarly low prescribing of DOAC therapies in individuals who are, or, or any anticoagulation rather, in individuals who are homeless. And so how are some of our social biases coming into impact the way we treat our patients needs to be addressed as well. Um, the C in this framework is around cost. Again, I mentioned um, a little bit around the out-of-pocket costs. I mentioned some of the opportunities we have in the VA around cost. Um, cost is a universal issue. Um, we here in the U.S. love being number one. This is not an area that we pridefully are number one in, but drug spending is a critical problem in, in the country. And again, I alluded to the uh, Medicare negotiation around pricing is one step to help to start to address this. Um, but while drug spending is a problem unique, uh, um, a problem for all individuals, especially here in the States, it does uniquely impact individuals of color. And this slide is looking at the um, household median net worth amongst individuals here in California. And it shows that black individuals and Mexican Americans hold about 1% of wealth um, compared to white American, white individuals here in, in my state. And this is hugely, hugely problematic. $5,000 um, median net worth uh, for Mexican Americans in California, or 3,500, excuse me. That can be someone's monthly co-payment for a medication, right? And so you can imagine, again, how individuals who have these challenges around their socioeconomic status really are not able to even consider these medications uh, on their list. And it's something that we have to think about really deeply um, and create policy to address if we want to be able to achieve pharmaco equity. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, quality really has to be the, the overarching theme around um, this goal. We can't have um, quality without really striving for equity, in my opinion. And for far too long, these two goals have been separated. There have been chief quality officers and chairs of quality and safety across the uh, health systems in the country. Um, but only over the last few years has equity really come into the C-suite of health systems or into um, and the forefront of a lot of system leadership. And I think this time is now for us to blend these two um, um, really, really critical themes together and really importantly blend each of these parts of the framework in terms of access bias, um, cost and quality to hopefully bring us towards a, a more just health system. And so again, I hope I was able to address our three objectives in the talk, um, describing why health equity matters using this still uh, moment of the pandemic to uh, bring forth the theme of pharmaco equity um, describing why atrial fibrillation I thought was a really important model disease for this topic and anticoagulants, important model drug um, for examining pharmacal equity. And, and lastly, closing with our framework, the ABCs, um, with quality being the overarching arm um, that brings it all together. So really, really grateful for the invitation to share with you all today. Um, I think we've got some time left for, for questions and comments um, and case discussion. And thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Utebe, for this brilliant presentation. It was packed full of information that I think everybody will be able to um, use as, as going forward when they're uh, trying to um, improve pharmacoequity. So um, I wanted to kick off the panel discussion with a patient case. And it's uh, related to your presentation. So AG is a 70-year-old black female with atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and diabetes who had been on warfarin therapy for 10 years. After a brief hospitalization, she was discharged home on a Pixaban, and the first fill was covered by the manufacturer's one-time voucher. When the patient attempted to refill her prescription for a Pixaban, she found it to be cost prohibitive. The patient checked with her pharmacist to find out if she would qualify for financial assistance, but because of her insurance coverage, she could not use the manufacturer's copay card. The cost to the patient, she was told, was going to be $300 for a 30-day supply and $800 for a 90-day supply. So this patient decided to switch back to warfarin. 
So this case illustrates how the cost of anticoagulants, particularly the preferred DOAC agents, impacts patient anticoagulation management, especially for underserved patients. And I just wanted to mention before I kick this off to the panel that um, in a study that was done by Henry Ford Health and the University of Michigan using data from the Michigan Anticoagulation Quality Improvement Initiative Registry, we found that at six participating anticoagulation clinics, there was no indication of implicit bias after controlling for differences in black and white patient groups. However, we did find that median household income could not be added to the matching criteria due to the large differences between the groups of black and white patients. In fact, median household income is approximately a third lower in black patients compared to white patients in our patient population. And it was concluded that it likely represents the largest barrier to DOAC use. So I'd like to talk to uh, present this to the panel and ask, um, most well, certainly this has probably been an experience at each of your anticoagulation clinics. And, I'd like to get your thoughts on how steps toward pharmacoequity might improve this patient situation. So I'd like to open up to the- I mean, go first and then love to hear from uh, my colleagues on the call as well. You know, I think this is a hugely important um, problem, I think. So a couple of themes that are coming out for me are this conversation around switching, um, which I, we haven't um, examined fully in our uh, analyses, but I imagine um, there there probably are important disparities to examine there. You know, who has been on a medication for X number of years um, and is more likely to switch. And I think there's inertia on the provider side saying, hey, you know, Miss uh, Miss G has been done great, but this medication, why switch them? Um, inertia on the patient side, I feel comfortable. I like knowing my numbers, et cetera. Um, but I also think there probably are some um, conversations that we're having, again, either um, sub subconsciously or not, uh, as clinicians where we say, you know, these medications are a little expensive. Um, you know, I, I just want to make sure that they're doing okay with these therapies. I've heard conversations, people say, you know, I, I worry that they're going to fail on, on newer treatments, so I'm not even going, to, we haven't even offered it to them. Um, so I think those are really important conversations that we're having. Great that um, Ms. G was offered. Uh, this treatment, and it is disappointing to see that that co the cost prohibitiveness, which again is not unique to Pixaban or the anticoagulants, we see this play out time and time again in, in our clinical settings. Um, the idea of um, the, the cost of medication not just being a reason for poor adherence, but or for switching back rather, but also being a reason for poor adherence came out in a study published. Um, by Benjamin Rome and colleagues a couple of years ago that specifically was looking at um, DOAC therapies and showed that individuals who had the highest tier of copayments so for their medications uh, were far less likely to adhere to these DOAC treatments um, compared to those who had the lowest tier. And so really putting data to the stories like uh, Ms. G's here um, to remind us that we need some huge policy changes to uh, addressing the cost of care. And I'm excited to see what happens with uh, Medicare being able to no negotiate prices. Obviously, that doesn't relate to people who have commercial insurance um, quite yet, but uh, definitely, hopefully, a step in the right direction. Yes. Yeah, I, I just, you know, this is a very interesting case, like UTB said, not uncommon at all. I wonder in this situation, if this patient had a shared decision-making conversation with her provider, or if the provider may be thinking that he or she was, was doing best, said, you know what, you're 70 years old, I'm gonna pre prescribe you a Pixaban, make sure you take it, take care. <laughs> so that's the first question is, you know, was there a shared decision-making conversation between her and her prescriber and any involved caregivers to decide what would be the best medication for her. And then one other note uh, Uchibe mentioned in the article was that we need better improved drug price transparency. So I wonder, you know, in this situation, did the prescriber even know what the cost of the medication would be for this patient? And if the prescriber did have that information up front or could refer the patient to a clinical pharmacist or another representative to discuss what the cost would be, then maybe she would be able to avoid this situation. They could discuss other 
treatment alternatives. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add that I've been fortunate being in the VA system to not have to navigate. I I think that the the VA is an interesting case study and what if drug what what if cost wasn't the right limiting factor, right? And to expound upon a little bit what, what Otibe mentioned earlier, not only are there three copays that are very reachable for most uh, folks, but in fact, some folks in the VA don't pay for prescriptions at all um, based on their service connection status. And if they have a low income waiver, they may pay zero for their prescriptions. And as a result, um, I, I believe that the VA probably exhibits the lowest proportion of anticoagulated patients remaining on warfarin. Nationally, I know that number to be 10% or less. Um, in my own uh, population of, of 3,500 or so anticoagulation patients, about 5.5% of them remain on warfarin, and we're able to avoid um, a lot of these issues. But this does beg, there, there's the ease of use of DOACs have created a bit of a double-edged sword as it relates to this. As some of you may know, um, the drug companies like Rivaroxaban uh, or uh, Janssen with Rivaroxaban, for example, they came out with a 30-day card that would allow you to treat the first month of a, of a venous thrombosis out of your sample closet. Very cool, very um, convenient, avoid some unnecessary ED referrals and that kind of thing. But then, but the question is, then what? And I think that some facilities have done a very good job of coordinating um, kind of the the then what after discharging a patient from the hospital or whatnot and utilizing their discharge planners and their pharmacists to understand what is the longer term impact of this decision on the patient's pocketbook. Um, but I don't think that that has been universally done. And this is a great example of how you can be very well intentioned and ultimately end up causing quite a bit of runaround or potentially uh, non-adherence with a very important therapy if you're not very careful. Okay, so I was. There are a few questions in the chat, um, in the Q and A, but I I wanted to preface this first question um, with the question of, of my own little background. So a um, in the article, a policy prescription for reducing health disparities that uh, UT Bay had published in JAMA, um, he talked about um, or. UTV, you talked about, uh, the need for increased representation of underrepresented groups in clinical trials and acknowledging the role in distrust in um, that some communities hold. And there is a question, um, how do we get more Black patients to participate in clinical trials and how do we overcome unconscious bias in healthcare? So I guess that's two questions. Yeah, that's a huge question, uh, April. Uh, probably another seminar just on on that topic alone. Um, I think the first part in terms of getting more uh, individuals from underrepresented backgrounds, including uh, black individuals into trials is again, it's a huge, it's a huge question. I think there are probably a couple, um, a couple ways that I would think about it. The first, um, again, I love frameworks. So I will think about access uh, as a, a first leg to that framework. Um, so, you know, where do trials typically happen? They're happening in these large academic medical centers where um, brilliant scientists are getting NIH funded grants to study the newest, greatest drug out there. Um, and so if an individual does not have access to said academic medical centers, it makes it pretty challenging to be able to enroll into these trials. If they don't have access to the oncology, cancer centers where these trials are taking place or um, the specialists, the cardiology specialists who are enrolling in these studies, it really gets hard for them to be able to actually participate. And so those are um, huge, huge challenges that we don't think about when we're coming up with insurance policies and in, in our large healthcare systems because they're so downstream. Um, but I think it's ways that are, are, are potential levers that we can pull to actually improve the representation of individuals of color in these studies. Um, so that access more broadly speaking, just literally more practically speaking. Um, and uh, it's expensive to come into a large academic center every uh, few weeks for a blood visit or blood draw visit rather to participate in, to, in a study. Um, and so I know Medicaid, for example, is starting to actually support um, uh, enrollment and trials financially to actually be able to help patients with some of the, in the, um, the challenges of actually coming in, paying for parking at the hospital, 
taking time off, child care, et cetera. Some of these issues that, again, it's easier for perhaps people who are retired or who have a little more flexibility in their schedule to be able to participate. So access big and small, I think, is one key way for us to address this. Um, allowing patients to be able to see what they, how they benefit. Um, so access and benefit, I think we need to do a much better job at. Um, you know, I can't just try to keep publishing papers in um, academic journals and think that I'm doing a great job at um, helping to relay the information to our patients because they're, we, as we know, they're not reading them. Um, so whether that's getting on the local news and on the local radio, whether that's actually sitting in with patients in their community settings um, to relay that information of SIRS research back to them, um, getting patients involved early on in the process. I have a really cool um, a colleague who's working on a really cool study um, called the FAITH trial in, in Rochester, Minnesota. And she has patients and from uh, individuals rather from their church community actually helping to write the grants for her team. And um, that's the only way I think that we're actually going to be able to have our patients and communities see what the benefits are um, of these studies. And so probably just two ways to answer that first part of the question. The second part around overcoming and conscious bias in healthcare is huge. Um, there have been a number of studies that have tried to actually address this, um, whether through making sure that all your um, community members in your health system take the implicit association test so we actually are aware of our biases. So I think that's the first step is awareness, um, not assuming that, you know, I don't say bad words to or call people by bad names so I, I can't have bias or I might not be racist that we all do have biases um, amongst ourselves um, and then the second is really just learning learning about how um, being aware of these biases and learning how we can actually address them and there's actually some really neat training that this jury is still out on how it reduces uh, unconscious bias but I think it is starting to help at least people name some of these um, biases that we may have so um, I think it's going to take a lot of hard work, uh, conversations like the ones we're having to fully overcome them. Uh, and, and healthcare is it's not in a silo of our larger environment here in the U.S. and in the world where there are conscious biases everywhere. So finding ways to deal with those as well are going to be important. Any comments from the panel? I I think that was beautifully spoken. I, I don't necessarily have anything to add. It reminds me of a, a conversation uh, with a church member. And, and I'm sure that many of the people on the call have experienced this where you're you're speaking with someone and they know that you're a healthcare professional. So they bring something up to you and they say, well, my doctor said to do this, but I don't know. My friend who I was speaking to over the salon or my buddy at the barber shop said that I shouldn't take it because because fill in the blank. And so, you know, I think Utipe makes a, a very important point is this mistrust in the healthcare system. And yet, you know, they're they're trusting their buddy or maybe their pastor or the, their hairstylist. And and so, you know, sometimes it, it could be getting into their communities. You know, they, they may not be going to the big medical center, but who can they trust in their community? And maybe that's where you can where you can start to try to rebuild that trust. In terms of uh, unconscious bias, I agree with taking the, the test. I mean, it was eye-opening for me. I took it myself. In fact, we have the information, so maybe we can uh, put it in the, the chat for our listeners. But one thing that UTB mentioned in the article that I hadn't thought of considered before is the use of decision support tool to help with unconscious bias. If you've got a decision support tool in your system that helps you to recognize what is the medication of choice in this patient, then it helps to reduce some of those biases that you may have. So I thought that was a, an important and very interesting point. Yeah, I guess the only other thing that I would add is that there's, you know, this issue is complex is that there, while there's been in, the, in, the, in what's been presented a lot of focus on race and ethnicity, there's there are other, um, you know, disparate groups. Uh, so there's disparities based on geography. There's disparities based on socioeconomic class. And there's certainly some crossover. Um, disparities based on gender, disparities based on age. Um, and in fact, Utebe's own VA work showed, that, you know, that when you kind of take cost out of it, we still see these disparities and things like age uh, and some of the Medicare work as well. Things like age over 85 and, and female gender also, 
uh, we're, we're, we're predictors of non-treatment of OA, of, uh, non-treatment and atrial fibrillation. Um, and, and so there's, there's a lot of, not only are there individual disparate groups, but there's crossover between them. Um, and so this, this is hard to get at. This is not easy. Um, and I guess one of the questions that I would have, if I'm allowed to ask the question on TV, uh, would, would, would be, is one thing to recognize the disparity and say, oh, I see that we got that wrong. I'm now going to go treat that group. But that's not true, true equity. True equity is having not had the issue in the first place. So, you know, how do we get at incorporating into practice um, things that we may not see because of the unconscious bias in the healthcare system? How do we build that into the upfront care that we're giving to avoid the problem in the first place? Absolutely. I mean, that's really the goal of um, this topic, in my opinion, is that we make the right choice, the easy choice all the time, um, that when the newest, you know, I think someone mentioned factor 10 A's in the uh, uh, 10 A's in the um, chat, anti 10 A's, when the newest therapy comes out to help treat DVTs, and we're no longer going to need, you know, six months or so, we're going to be able to do it in four weeks, um, who's going to get access to that therapy? And tradition and research has shown that it's going to be those who are wealthier, those who are from certain racial backgrounds, those who have access to healthcare. Um, but what are the steps that we can start to take today um, so that in 10 years when that drug comes out, we can prevent the likely um, disparities that we've seen. And I think, um, thanks for Naomi for reminding me of what we wrote about two years ago. I think decision support tools are helpful there. Um, I, I think really uh, improving access, uh, as I keep mentioning, has to happen so that we're, because access will really help us with getting not just these drugs, but any other other drugs out there. Um, and I think the issues around unconscious bias get to diagnosis as well, right? And so if you don't, um, if you're showing up too late to get an AFib, I think is a helpful model because you're not always just going to have that leg pain and coming with a DVT and have something show up on um, on your ultrasound, but you may have a little bit of a fluttering and some anxiety and you go into your office and the doctor's office and they say, you're probably just nervous. You probably just ate something badly and kind of keep kicking that can down the road until you finally get diagnosed. Um, and I think there definitely is differential act. We've seen rather the data and I think, um, that show differential access to diagnosis amongst, um, racial ethnic groups and by, um, socioeconomic status. And that, again, in turn, leads to differential treatment as well. So the kind of question around um, how does unconscious bias affect treatment actually goes all the way back to, to diagnosis. And uh, I think we have to keep going further upstream to be able to make sure that the downstream issue of treatment happens equitably as well. Yeah, one of the thoughts that came to my mind when I read April, April Allen's question there, the first part is, you know, how do you get more of these disparate groups to participate in clinical trials? The word that came to my mind was intentionally, mm -hmm. uh, that it has to be, I think, built in as part of the study protocol. And and uh, not only the the population, but the how we're going to get them needs to be part of the large, large trials for us to start getting at this from the ground level. So um, just uh, to let everybody know that if you look in the chat, there is a link to the implicit association test that was mentioned. Um, and there's a another comment about the uh, next generation anticoagulation is particular, in particular, could be very much useful in areas where PGX guided therapies are not available. If you had mentioned that. Um, Kurt Mahan has a question, how much weight uh, in, in percent uh, of the disparities or inequities may be reduced or improved if there was an improved minimal universal health care system in the U.S.? Do countries with universal health care demonstrate lower rates of disparities and inequities? Yeah, really great question, Kurt. It's one of my favorite questions because I'm... Uh manifesting my sabbatical in London uh, in a few years to be able to more deeply um, study this question. Um, so three thoughts there. I don't have a percentage. I wish I could um, give you one, but um, the Veterans Health Administration, I think, serves as our model here in the U.S., right? So um, uh, fun fact, we do already provide universal health care in our country to uh, millions of individuals um, across the country. Uh, and I think that we um, can continue to strive to do that um, to improve access to care. Sadly, with atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation, we see we still see the disparities exist. But there's so many examples within the VA 
especially around treatment out, um, health outcomes, mortality, um, um, cancer uh, related outcomes where the gap in disparities is far narrower than what we see outside the VA. So it's really, I think a great environment uh, and model and one where we don't have to think about the cost, which is huge. Um, but we still have to keep being really intentional, um, like Arthur mentioned, around reducing racial inequity. So we have the VA example. Um, the two other examples I'll give are in uh, the UK and in Canada. Um, and I, I don't think I'll be able to pull the studies out as quickly as I want to to put in the chat. But um, both of those environments, which have universal um, health care and low, uh, low medication prescription costs, uh, have shown disparities. Um, across racial and ethnic groups and specifically in atrial fibrillation treatment. Um, they're definitely, our countries are all very different in terms of how um, racial groups are represented. I think there are far more um, Black, Asian, and multi-ethnic individuals in the UK than are in Canada. Um, but um, we do start to see some of the racial disparities play out in both of those countries. And so Sadly, universal healthcare is not the answer, um, as we're seeing across these three systems that I just mentioned, but it does help to start to narrow um, the gap. And I think we also see in those settings, um, a lot of those studies, because they have smaller rates of racial ethnic minorities, have actually looked especially around neighborhood disadvantage and look to see how neighborhoods, um, um, how likely are you are to get these prescriptions if you live in a certain neighborhood that has lower socioeconomic status, has um, lower education levels, lower income levels, et cetera. Um, we had an amazing medical student who did a similar analysis here in the VA uh, and showed similarly that the poorer your neighborhood is, the less likely you are to have patients with AFib prescribed um, DOAC therapies. And so um, I think that's one other way to start to address this point. Um, uh, and another reminder, unfortunately, that uh, the universality of healthcare does not fully explain everything. Um, it's why we have to continue to look deeply in terms of what could be the mechanisms of these disparities. Okay. Um, so we have about three minutes left here. So I'm going to um, go back to sharing my screen, I'm sorry for the delay here. And, okay. So again, I would like to thank our presenters, um, Utibe, Arthur, Naomi. Um, excellent presentation, excellent discussion. I wish we had more time to talk about this. Um, I know there's a lot more that we could talk about with this discussion, but thank you all so much for um, presenting today. Uh, I want to remind everyone how to claim their CE credit. Again, um, it's an accredited hour of ethics CE available. So please uh, use this website and um, follow the instructions here. Um, and then uh, boot camp is, um, the registration is open for boot camp. Uh, but let me talk about the uh, YouTube first. Um, if you're unaware, AC Forum has created a webinar archive on YouTube. You can subscribe today to the in, uh, at anti coag forum account to get notified when new videos are added. And boot camp registration is open. Join us for this compact two-day live virtual meeting on October 13th and 14th with extended on-demand access for 30 days. This year's boot camp has 20 presentations and 15 hours of CE credit available, so don't miss this opportunity. And I, as always, we want to thank our webinar sponsors listed here. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time and attention. I hope you have a great day.